God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, and faithful promise wins. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. It let my heart know in you fast. Great is your Sun from 
as we go into this next song, I just want you to think of God's goodness. And as I read Psalm 23, 6, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, God, we just take this time to worship you, God, to magnify you, God, for all the goodness and the mercy that you give us each and every single day, God. And we just thank you and we praise you in your precious name. be seated. God, as we come um, together to, to hear um, Dr. Stevens' message, God, I pray that our minds and our hearts are focused on you. God, that you would um, speak through Dr. Stevens um, and, and as he goes um, through your word this morning. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
to be one. When we think of superheroes, perhaps we want the fame. We want comic books written about us, and we want movies about us, and that kind of thing. Uh, maybe it's the control and being in control of, of difficult situations that we love. But I wonder if we've ever really seriously thought about the motivation of a superhero or about the responsibility. I, I, I just want you to imagine Batman, Batman perched on the top of some building, keeping his eye open, you know, for some kind of crime, always having to be looking for the bat signal to come out. And superheroes have this amazing vigilance, and they have to prepare really hard to, to uh, face the dangers that they face. Because when they go out on their missions, the superhero's life is always up for grabs. You hear what I'm saying? Being a superhero is challenging, and being a superhero is dangerous. Now, I'm not really big on superheroes. I wanted to... Uh, rip my shirt open and show you, you know, one of my superhero t-shirts, but I ran into this problem. I don't have any. I don't own a piece of clothing with superheroes on it. I'm like, I'm pretty lame. I walk around school and I see you guys in your superhero stuff and, and uh, I'm just jealous of you. I have a son who every, every day when he makes his bed, Superman and Spider-Man go on each side of his pillow. And then when he goes to bed, he takes them off and he gently sets them down. And, uh, you know, those are his heroes. But, but I, so I decided to wear the closest thing I had to a superhero, and this is what I came up with. And uh, I don't know, you, we don't wear ties that much, so you don't see my, my Looney Tune stuff. But Trisha, <laughs> Trisha and Zach got me one of my favorites. Uh, I love the Martian, and he's like the anti-hero. So I don't know what that says about me. Our story today in Scripture is about protecting people from the greatest of evils. That's what our story is about today. And we're going to take a look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and, and we're going to enter into a story that's taking place between an old superhero and a young superhero. It's, uh, the setting is about the, uh, uh, the seventh decade of the first century A.D. And the old superhero's name is Paul. And the young superhero's name is Timothy. And, and Paul is getting ready. He's getting ready to hang up his, uh, what do you call the thing that superheroes wear? I've heard cape. But what if you're Spider-Man? Outfit, uniform, I don't want to hear costume because that just sounds fake. They're suits, there we go. So he's, Paul is, is, is about ready to hang up his suit and um, he wants the young superhero to take up his task and he wants him to know how important that task is and so he writes the words that we're going to read today and this young superhero's task is going to be rescuing people. And the old superhero wants the young guy to know how important the task of protecting people is. Because that's what a superhero does, right? A superhero protects. Are you ready for a story like this, young Padawan? I just mixed my metaphors there. You're not supposed to do that at I think Billy says, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I may not pay attention to anything Billy says uh, in this sermon today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. It says, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. As a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, a firm foundation of God stands, 
having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. When I started preparing this sermon, and this is the first sermon in a, a three-sermon series called Challenge Accepted, that's the series title, Challenge Accepted, and the title of my sermon that I was given is Study Hard. Study hard. And so I'm supposed to talk to you about studying hard and being good servants. Paul tells Timothy to be diligent. And he tells Timothy that Timothy is a craftsman. He's a laborer. His medium is the word of truth. Timothy's approach to that medium is to be diligent in his work. It's an important work. And Paul is overseeing, and God is overseeing Timothy's work. When I was a student at Central Christian College of the Bible, I worked for a master furniture maker. And he oversaw everything I did from staining to finishing to putting in the springs and putting the padding on the couches and the chairs that we were creating. And he oversaw every step of it. He wanted me to become as skilled as he was. As Paul writes this letter, he's thinking about Timothy, and he wants Timothy to use the skills that he has learned over the years. And I want to say something weird to you all. Are you ready? And I say this to students fairly often. A lot of times I say, students, students, you are scholars. And some of you laugh at me because you don't believe you are. But I want you to believe this. You are my hero. You are God's superhero. Do you believe that? In this passage of scripture, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to be a superhero with God's word. And the word that he uses here, be diligent, the word means to work hard. It means to give your very best effort. And Timothy is being charged with being a master of the word of truth. It's not surprising that God's word is called a sword because Paul says throughout this passage that it is used to protect. It is used to defend. It is used to rescue. It is used to say, have you ever thought about being a superhero of God's word? That's what I want to invite you to think about today. I remember when I was a student right here at Central Christian College of the Bible, and every day our classes got over at noon and I had to drive over to Mulkey's Furniture Store where I was, I was the assistant there for Clyde, the master craftsman. And I had an hour between class getting out and work starting at 1 o'clock. And I would take my cooler with me, which had my lunch, which had the same thing in it every single day. It had a bologna sandwich and a bag of potato chips and an apple. And I ate that every day, and I sat in my 1965 Ford pickup truck, and I set my Bible on the steering wheel, and during that hour while I was eating, I read God's Word. And for the first time in my life, I read through the Bible from the beginning to the end. You guys are thinking, oh, these classes are difficult, and maybe, you know, maybe uh, the, the, the freshness and the newness of the semester has worn off, but I want to say to you, I want to say to you that you need to be a superhero of God's word. And I want to challenge you to work hard in your classes, but also work hard outside of class. One of my first superheroes was a dog. It wasn't my dog. It was a dog that was in a book that I read and then in a movie that I saw. And this was a dog that... Uh, uh, the, the, the story was that there was this family on the frontier of Texas and the dad had to leave to go with his neighbors, I think, on a cattle drive to Kansas. And so he left his wife and two sons at home and he's going to be gone for a long time. And so it's kind of a scary situation to be left like that. And right after their dad left, this, this old dog showed up. And the old dog was a problem because he would like steal eggs and he was always getting into stuff and, and, and the, their food was never safe around him. And so Travis, the, 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 the young, he's probably about 12 or 13 years old, he wanted to get rid of the dog. But Arliss, the six-year-old, he wanted to keep the dog. And he was just absolutely in love with this mangy mutt. 
and, and Ma, she voted with Arliss. And so they kept the dog around. And so one day, Arliss was out, and he was just wandering around like kids do on, on farms and out in the country, and he found a bear cub all by itself. And, and guess what? Just like he wanted the dog for a pet, he wanted the cub for a pet. And so he's trying to get the cub to come home. I think he used cornbread and maybe honey, and he's trying to entice this bear cub to come along with him. And all of a sudden, here comes the snarling, you know what? Mama bear. You guys know what mama bears are, right? Here comes the mama bear, and Arliss is in trouble. And I don't know what Arliss felt like, but I can imagine he was terrified. But before the bear could get to Arliss, here comes the dog. Boom! And they get into this fight, and they're both standing up on their hind legs and slapping each other upside the head, and, and Arliss is able to take off and, and the, bear, the dog leaves and the bear has its cub and, and everything is, is safe. Imagine how terrified Arliss would have been at the sight of that monster. Have you ever been in a situation where you were terrified? And there was some animal that was threatening you and, and uh, it just like scared you to death. But here comes the dog. And the dog defends, and the dog protects. And at that point, Travis and Ma, they fell in love with the dog. Imagine when they think about what the dog just did, how important that would have been to them. Think of the relief that would have come into their, into their thoughts that the dog kept the bear from killing Ma's son or Travis's brother. And so from that day on, that dog was part of the family. In Timothy's world, there were people who had gone away from the truth. They even denied the resurrection. And Paul says, if you deny the resurrection, if you don't believe in the resurrection, there is no point in being a Christian. There is no point in following Jesus if there's no benefit to it. And false teaching can ruin the hearers. And who's going to protect them? And Paul tells Timothy, work hard and know God's word because people need the truth. And the truth is in God's word. I propose to you today that you are in the same shoes as Timothy. Let that sink in a little bit. I challenge you to work hard to know God's word because people need the truth. You guys got your listening guide there? I imagine there's like three of you who have your listening guide and going to take some notes here. Work hard to know God's word because people need the truth. There are those who oppose the truth and it's going to be your responsibility to defend the truth. How's your semester going? You got assignments now that are due one after another. Have you got your planner filled out for the whole semester? It's Tuesday morning. Have you got all your homework done for this week? Have you got your electronic calendar that notifies you when an assignment is, is due? Those of you who have been through some of our programs here and were involved with me, you guys know about due dates, that's D-U-E dates, and due dates, that's D-O dates, and review dates, and I tried to drill that into your head. I've got lots of ways I can teach you how to learn God's Word, but I'm not going to share them all now. I just want to motivate you today. Come and see me later. What I'm concerned about is this. Are you leaning in to the hard work of being a student because you know there's going to be a day that you're going to need God's word? There's going to be a day you need God's word when you're doing ministry. So discovering the Bible students, there are about 30 of you here. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see, when you put God's word in, 
there are times when God's word comes out and it comes out in perfect timing. Are you leaning into the hard work of a student who knows you're going to defend and protect those who are weak? Well, let's go back to our story of Paul and Timothy. And I'm going to start with verse 20. Paul says to Timothy, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but vessels of wood and of earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, love, faith, and peace with those who call on God from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing they produce quarrels. In this section, I think Paul warns Timothy about two things that can derail him and that can uh, uh, cause him to fail to understand uh, God's will for him now. And it will hurt God's will for him later. He says, determining right now, you are determining right now how effective you're going to be in ministry. Two things he says. He says, keep yourselves pure. And he speaks about that a little bit. And then he says, keep yourself pure out of arguments he calls them youthful lusts are any of you youthful you got any head shaking you got any desires inside of you that you know is not God's you know they're not God's will for you right now Paul says stay away from those things because giving into those things are going to damage your credibility and giving into those things are, are keeping you from investing now in God's word so you will have it then. Timothy also has opportunities to have weird discussions and uh, uh, to, to, to get into arguments. But those arguments are going to damage relationships. And people wounded in those kinds of conversations are going to have a difficult time finding God. In my superhero story, Travis, and I don't know where he got this idea, Travis, that's the, the 12, 13-year-old, he's, he's going to catch some hogs, and he's going to mark their ears with a knife with the, the families. It's like branding these hogs. And these are like wild hogs running around. And so his idea is he's going to climb up in a tree, and the hogs are going to come by, and he's going to lasso them. And then he's going to haul them up, and then he's going to cut their ears, and then he's going to let them go. And so here come the hogs, and he catches a baby hog and, and brings it up. What do you call it? Piglet. And he notches the ears of that, and he lets him go. And then he drops his rope back down amongst this, this, this big group of hogs, and he catches a hog that's too big. And the next thing you know, Travis is out of the tree, and he's on the ground, and these wild hogs are all stirred up because he's been capturing the piglets and they've been squealing and everybody's all excited and, and so they start to attack Travis and next thing you know, boom, here comes the dog and the dog comes in and begins to fight with the hogs and Travis is able to get away with just some wounds to his legs but eventually the hogs leave and Travis has to go back to his dog and his dog is laying there and he's severely injured. In fact, he's injured in such a way that's so grotesque, I can't even describe it to you today because of your youth. I think I can't tell you that. That was a joke. Come on. <laughs> Travis's mom has to sew the dog's stomach back together. And it takes him a long time to recover. But again, you get the lesson that the dog is committed, sold out to protect, no matter what the costs are to himself. What do we need to learn from what Paul is saying to Timothy? We need to work carefully to show, share God's word because people are hurting. There are those who wound, and, and Paul names some of those people in this passage. These are people who have gone astray and they're leading others astray. There are people who wound, so you must heal. Be a healer and your instrument is the word of God. 
You're not studying hard today so you can win in a debate about theology tomorrow. You're not studying hard today. You are studying hard today so you can give hope to the hopeless and you can give joy to the joyless. Your hard study now prepares you for then. Your hard study now prepares you for then when the 12-year-old boy in your youth group, his dad dies of a heart attack. Your hard study now prepares you for the then when a 36-year-old mother with breast cancer is sitting on her bed in her gown ready for surgery and she's shaking like a leaf and she's terrified. You're studying now so you can speak to the 70-year-old man who just lost his entire retirement in a stock market crash. You're studying hard now so when the prison guard in tears at the back of church says my wife has cancer and I don't know what to do. A big strong man a championship handgun shooter whatever you call those wants trophies all over the place and yet for the first time in his life, when he's about 50 years old, he realizes he's mortal, but he doesn't really care about his own mortality. He realizes his wife is mortal, and he has no answers for that problem. Study hard now for the mother whose son's girlfriend is leaving him and taking her only grandchild out of state, and she has nothing to give to her son when her son has called her up and said, I have no reason to live. And she's got nothing to give him. Work carefully to share God's word because people are hurting. There are people who wound and there are people who are wounded. You must heal. We've got one more little section to go here in Paul's conversation with Timothy. He says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Take a look at the words that describe God's superhero. Patient. Kind to all, able to teach, correcting with gentleness. Remember those who have been deceived and those who have been wounded are not your enemies. Paul says it's the devil who sets the snare. And the purpose of the snare is to capture and kill. Or the purpose of the snare is to capture and to put in captivity. Jesus calls Satan a murderer and a liar from the very beginning. But appropriate words of life can break through people's hard hearts and lead them to repentance. There's this wonderful passage in the book of Hebrews where we're told the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces through all the way to the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is powerful. And when people hear it and they're in captivity, they have the opportunity to escape their captivity and find freedom in God's truth. So lastly, I want to encourage you to work compassionately to share God's word because people are in captivity. Work compassionately to share God's word because people are in captivity. There are those out there who set traps. And traps are not usually for good purposes. You must be someone that sets free. I believe that people without Jesus Christ in their life are lost. How about you? Do you believe that? Do you care about people who are lost? Do you care about people who are hurting? Jesus Christ cared so much that he left his place in heaven and came to earth and became a person like you and I. And when we look at ourselves, we see weakness. But he brought 
his power into our weakness, but he, he, he didn't use it. He laid it down. And he died on a cross in our place. And God raised him from the dead and, and, and he offered grace to us. And the superhero uses the spirit of Jesus and the word of truth to protect and save. My superhero story has one last challenge. In that area in Texas at that time, there was a, a rabies epidemic going on and the family's milk cow got infected with rabies and so they had to um, put her down and then they had to destroy uh, her carcass. And while they were in the process of doing this, a wolf comes and attacks. And so Ma is out outside the house and she's yelling for Travis to come and Travis grabs his gun and he runs out there and here's this wolf and along comes the dog and again the dog and the wolf get into this fight and they're rolling around and they're jumping around and Travis has his gun and he's lifting his gun up and he's aiming it and he, and he can't he's afraid to shoot because he they're changing so much he can't get a bead on him and he puts his rifle down but but then he he realizes the dog's in serious trouble so he picks the rifle up again and he's trying to find He's trying to find a, a shot and he can't get the shot. And then the wolf pins the dog down to the ground and Travis shoots. And both animals are laying there still. And Travis goes over and the wolf is dead. And the dog is torn to pieces. But he's alive. And Ma says, she says we're going to have to put him down. The wolf, no wolf would do what that wolf did. That wolf has to be rabid. We've got to put the dog down. And Travis, thinking back, I'm sure, over all the things that that dog had done for them, to save them and to protect them, Travis can't even imagine killing that dog who had saved his own life. So he begs his mother, let's put him in a fence. Let's fence him up and let's wait and see what happens. Let's wait and see if he's infected. But sure enough, Arliss goes out and Arliss goes to visit his dog and the dog gets aggressive and tries to attack Arliss and Travis knows he's got to put the dog down so he goes out there takes his rifle and this mangy mutt with this great big wonderful heart whose every breath has breathed out protection for this vulnerable family he has to kill that dog and as I thought about that story, I thought about this, what I thought was an amazing, and certainly it's an ironic, it's an ironic truth. And that is, that old dog taught that family a very important truth. That old dog taught that family to protect each other at all costs. And don't think of yourself, think of others. People need you to connect them to God. They need you to protect them from what will hurt them. In this passage, Paul teaches Timothy to minister God's word to God's people. And he tells him he has to do this because the truth needs to be defended. He has to do this because the wounded need an opportunity to heal. He needs to do this because the captives need set free. And I want to say to you today, because the truth needs to be defended, and because the wounded need to heal, and because the captives need to set free, study hard. And you be a superhero with God's word.
Bless my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior, that cursed You guys are dismissed. Um, if you would grab your chairs, um, have a great week. Mm.